I don't know that I'll make it to noon. Because <laughs> this talk, is it's the first time I've given it, so I really don't know how long it's going to take. If it goes longer than noon, we're in trouble. Um, but it won't. It won't. Um, but I call this, um, again, keeping with the debunk. We've been doing debunked videos now for 12 years. Uh, the very first one, just to give you a little backstory, um, I had been trying to make videos with the ministry that I was with before that mature folks, you, you'll probably remember this. Remember the old Mac PC commercials? Hey, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC. And it was just that tongue in cheek, you know, I loved it. So, hey, I'm a creationist, I'm an evolutionist. And I had written a couple, three strip, uh, scripts. And where I worked was like, nah, we're not doing that. <laughs> And uh, my best friend at that time, he wrote me an email. He didn't know that I'd been trying to write, uh, get these videos produced. So he wrote me and he said, Carl, you got to watch this video. That's it. So I go in and watch this video, and it was a Mac PC parody. Hi, I'm Creation. I'm Evolution. And I was like, this is great. So I find out who made it, and I wrote them. It was a, just a blind letter. I said, man, I've been trying to get these things made for a couple years now, and now I understand why I couldn't do it, because you're making them at a level that I never could have dreamed of. These are great. I'm a fan. Guy writes me back, Carl, I'm on your mailing list. I'm a fan. <laughs> get out of here. So it just so happened that I was going to speak in Porterville, California, and uh, they were in Southern California. I said, man, bring your wife, bring your daughter up. want to meet you. Let's talk. So he came up to Porterville, California. He heard me speak 11 times over a weekend. It was a Sunday afternoon after church, and we're eating at an Italian restaurant in Porterville, California. I remember it very clearly. And he's like, so Carl, what do you want to do? I said, man, younger generation just thinks different. And so I want to come after them with uh, a video that takes on the topics that I'm getting thrown. You know, I'm getting this, oh, there is no evidence for God. If God created everybody, then everything, then who created God? Couldn't fit all the animals on the boat, right? I mean, all this kind of stuff. And I want to create these short videos that are, I call it a boxing match. Stick and move, stick and move, right? You know, you hit, and then you move, and then three seconds later, somebody's like, oh, did he really just say that, you know? And, uh, but I said, it's Dirty Jobs meets Mythbusters with a Ford F-150 look and feel to it. Those commercials, if you remember back, they had that, realistic cartoon combination and, and their commercials and Dirty Jobs Mythbusters were the two really popular shows at that time and the first debunked was created. It was called uh, They Couldn't Fit All the Animals on the Boat, debunked. That debunked has had over three and a half million views that I can document, that I can document. I know it's a lot more than that, but I can document that. And it was so funny that I made it with the previous ministry that I was with, and they hated it. <laughs> hated it. No, nah, we're not doing those. <laughs> so we ended up doing, the last thing I did for them before I left was a series called Check This Out. And they're looking like a debunked video, but um, the humor is not there, and they're slowed down a hair, all right? And uh, so I did those for them, and I left. And I was always devastated because they said, no, nah, we're not doing that. But then when I left, I was like, they said, no, that means I own debunked. We're making more debunked videos. So the Lord actually worked it out so that I could keep debunked and uh, create them. And now we're up to 23. But that was kind of the format that I then started taking on my talks. Let's take the issues, let them speak, let their evidence be put out there, and debunk it. I just felt like that was the way to do it. So that's what we're going to do with this. I call this debunking path to birds. And it's going to be very similar to the last talk with a twist, all right? Job 12, 7 tells us this, but ask the beasts and they will teach you, the birds of the heavens and they will tell you. What will the birds tell us if we look at them? Well, let's take a look. Uh, before I do that, you guys know who Chris Angel is? Illusionist, right? Oh, you know who Chris Angel is. <laughs> Got some interesting stuff. Let me show you something here that I found very interesting. He's going to explain how he does one of his famous illusions where you're standing behind him and he levitates. It's like, what? You know, I've seen the videos. He's out on the street and people are just like blown out of the water. He's going to explain how he does this illusion. Quality of the video is not that good. Sorry, it's the best I could find. But I think it's got a point to it. So take a watch.
two, three, four. Stick my feet together. Now they're magnetized. Make sure I'm in the center of the spectator. I would misdirect while I was talking to them. I'd get a hold of the material. I'd say, okay, watch. While I'm doing this and talking to them, saying, stay right there, I'm taking my left hand, removing the panel. And when I come back around, I just pull it apart so it's done. Now I'm ready in position to take my leg right out. Remember, it's important to create some misdirection. You don't want them concentrating on your legs at this point. You want them looking elsewhere so that you can do the dirty work, which is probably the most difficult part to get your leg out and planted, and then to get your leg back in is where you really need to be slick. When you're in this position, I usually just bring my hands forward while I come and get everything to position. Now the next phase of this is just literally to balance yourself, as we discussed before, and just create the illusion and presentation that you're going to float. Arch your back, look up in the air, bring your hands up and be. And now you've got to keep your heel pointed to the ground so you keep the back of your legs taut. Boom. And then you can land. How's that look? Looks good. Now you can either float up to the top or you can float back down and you get your foot back in. But if you float to the top, you can float up to the top. Boom. And this is the position you land in. Your foot actually lands on top of the shoe. This is obviously the most difficult technique and effect to do, which I did on a uh, sidewalk and I also did uh, in a bar. Okay. So what's that got to do with anything? I think it's got a lot to do with everything. Because this is Satan's realm. He's very good at deceiving. He's very good at taking things that aren't real and making them look real. So let's take a couple of points that he made here. He said this, I need to make sure that I'm in the center. Satan wants to be front and center. And he's going to do these things to, to draw our attention. Placement is very important. He goes on, he says this, I will misdirect others while I am speaking to them. I see this in museums all the time is a misdirection. You give me the reconstruction, but where is the actual evidence that you found? Why don't you put that alongside of it so that I know what you actually have? That is a misdirection. How about this next one? I will create distractions so that they're not concentrating on what is actually happening. We have a generation that is absolutely, completely, and totally distracted. There's so much stuff being thrown at them, it gets to the stage where it's just like, Phew. Dude, whatever. You know, it must be true because everybody knows. I mean, I turn on TV. And have you guys ever seen the uh, documentary Social Dilemma? It's not a Christian one. Anybody? Anybody? I'm going to highly recommend that you go watch it. I mean this. It's not Christian. I'm telling you right up front. But what they tell you is what, look, if I do a search for something in my hometown of Hebron, Kentucky, and then I come out here to Seattle and I do a search for it, you're going to get totally different results. Because what they will reveal to you is based on your, what they have uh, about you, the knowledge that they have about you, your location. It gets to the stage where we become so force-fed with what we think, what we believe, we don't see outside opinions anymore. I do a search on Google, I am going to get very specific things and I'm not going to get stuff outside of that. So we have to make a conscious effort to look beyond our little circle if we want to get to things. Um, Social Dilemma is the name. I think you can probably watch it on Netflix if you've got Netflix, but I, it's, it, it is well worth it. It's, it's scary, quite frankly. <laughs> it really is. I get them to look elsewhere so I can do my dirty work. Oh, my goodness. I just see that so much in textbooks and in all this sort of a thing. And I really need to be slick while I'm working. Ooh, this is Satan's realm. And I think these illustrations and the re reconstructions that I'm showing to you, is it, that's it. And one, one last one. It's all about the illusion and presentation of what I want them to believe is real. Go to a museum, and that's exactly what you're going to get. So I like to take their exhibits on and deal with them. That's why I like leading tours through the Smithsonian, the London Museum of Natural History. Phew, great place to lead tours from a biblical perspective. 
So we're going to kind of do that. We're going to look at these things. Now, before I do that, we have to first talk about worldview. Because this is the bottom line. This is where the problem really runs into, we really run into a problem, is worldview. What's a worldview? It's not that complex, quite frankly. It's just the way that you see the world around you. And we are all influenced by what we know, what we in input into us. Uh, I found there's a great DVD that uh, the Apologetics Forum has back there, and I would highly encourage you, every one of you, to buy every copy that they have and share it. It's an older documentary, but it's well done. It's called Expelled. And if you've not seen it, this is the only place that I've seen copies of it. It's kind of hard to find now because it's a little older. But the quality is not faded. It's well done, okay? Ben Stein did us a favor, and he did some really interesting interviews with people. And let me share a snippet of that with you. And I'm telling you, you need to give it to every one of those. John Lennox talking about worldview. If you have two distinguished scientists, and in fact you can range many more on each side, as you know, saying exactly opposite things, that's telling me that the conflict is not between science and belief in God, otherwise you'd expect all scientists to be atheists, but it's a worldview conflict. It's between scientists who have different worldviews. You've got two competing explanations of the evidence. One says design, one says undirected processes. Both of them have larger philosophical or religious or anti-religious implications. So you can't say that one of those two theories is scientific and the other is unscientific simply because they have implications. Both have implications. People who tell you, for example, that science tells you all you need to know about the world, or that science tells you that religion is all wrong, or science tells you there is no God, those people aren't telling you scientific things. They are saying metaphysical things, and they have to defend their positions for metaphysical reasons. What is being presented to the public is, first comes the science, and then comes the worldview. I would want to argue that that may not be the case, that it may actually be the other way around, that the worldview comes first and is influencing the interpretation of science. Mr. Tom, I think that's exactly what you said earlier when we were talking about it. They have their idea and now everything's going to be taken and filtered and put in to fit that idea. That's exactly the problem that we have going on. So critical thinking to overcome this is vitally important. If we don't do it, we're done. One of the things we need to be able to do is differentiate between fact and opinion. I'm a simple man, obviously, son of a professional wrestler, IQ's not stressed in your home. So I need simple illustrations. What is the difference between a fact or opinion? Let's let Garfield explain it to us. You can get this on your app, by the way, or on your phone, there's an app, Garfield Fact or Opinion. It's awesome. So here we go. Uh, that's right. You need to be active when you read and figure out what you're reading is true. Who says, yes, that's a good idea? Absolutely. That's a great idea. You better be active. And here we go. It's, if it's a fact, something that can be proven true, all right, that's what a fact is, um, or opinion, something that someone believes but can't necessarily be proven. So that's the difference between a fact or an opinion, all right? Something that can be proven to be true, opinion is something that someone believes but can't be proven. And I'm going to suggest to you that we don't have a problem with the facts. We have a problem with the opinion. And the opinion is impacted by the worldview. That's why they all tie together and we have to deal with them. Uh, I, I told the guys yesterday, and I'll tell you guys as well, when you go download our, our app, when you go download our, you heard what I said, when you go download our app, hello? While you're there, go and download the 1828 Dictionary. All you got to search is 1828 Dictionary, and there's going to be a bunch of them that pop up. Just get the free one. I'm not telling you to buy it, but get the free one. It doesn't look as pretty, but it works. Use that as a standard referent. Those of you that were in There Is No Truth Talk, you know what I'm talking about. Use that as a standard referent for words. And... Uh, the other night when I told you guys to download this, I said, go type in the word science. Let me show you what I mean by that. You type in the word science in a 1828 dictionary, anything done or that comes to pass, an act, a deed, an effect produced or achieved, an event, witnesses are introduced into court to prove a fact. Reality, oh, I said science, didn't I? Sorry, I meant fact, because we're talking about fact and truth. Uh, reality, truth is in fact, so we may, uh, so we say indeed. What's an opinion? An opinion is 
the truth or falsehood of which is supported by a degree of evidence that renders it probably but does not produce absolute knowledge or certainty. Okay? So now we know what a fact and opinion is. Keep that in mind as we start going through here. And we also need to define science. What is science? Big claim, as I showed you in our last debunked, Christians can't do science. Well, what is science? Science literally means knowledge. And how do you gain the knowledge? Well, you gain knowledge through the scientific method. By the way, by the way, this is a group that apologetics form comes to quite a bit. So you know this an answer. Who gave us the scientific method? A Christian. Anybody know his name? And he wasn't just a Christian. He was a creationist. People laugh at his name, but it's a great name. Sir Francis Bacon. Anything with bacon is good, all right? And I'm telling you, that smoked egg pie thing out there had bacon on it, and it was awesome, all right? Sir Francis Bacon. He's the guy that gave us the scientific method. He was a Christian. He was a creationist. So when somebody tells you that you, we can't do science because we believe in God, hello, it originated in our mindset. Because we said, if you want to understand the creator, study his creation, because his attributes will be in what he made. So study the creation, you'll know more about the creator. So yes, we can do science. Now the scientific method, are you familiar with the scientific method? Who in here is familiar? Who can, who can give us an explanation? Mr. Ron, you still got a mic? Or did I run you to death? You got a, all right, who, who, who can get, I saw a hand over here. All right, let me explain the scientific method to our folks here. All right, hold on, give them the mic. I, can't, I don't know if I can give a complete explanation, but it's, uh, it has to be observable and testable and repeatable. There you go. All right. So observable, testable, repeatable. It's a very simple process, not deep, not complex. Very important that we understand that, though, so let me give you this illustration. Scientific method. You take an observation, and what do you do? You come up with a hypothesis. Oh, I'm sorry, you ask a question so that you can then come up with a hypothesis to see if you can figure out what you're observing or not. Then what do you do? As we were told, you test it. And based on the ex what you get, whatever results that you get, uh, it's going to take you in one of a couple of different directions. One is it's consistent with what you're saying, or the other is it's not consistent. If it's not consistent, you start back at the beginning and do the whole process over, or you give up, right? So, this is the scientific method, which came from Sir Francis Bacon. So we're gonna do some application here. We're gonna do some application. We live in a world that is telling this generation that given enough time, right circumstances, everything came from nothing. You think I'm messing with you? There is one answer that appears to avoid this problem. The idea is that the universe could be um, spontaneously created out of nothing. He's not the only one that says that, but for time's sake, I'm just going to give you the one. Well, no, I'll give you another one. Let me give you Peter Atkins. He doesn't like us. He's a nasty guy. And it may be that our universe happens to be that happy chance of nothing transforming itself into what seems to be something that seems to persist. So there we go. The battle lines are drawn. In the beginning, nothing created everything, or in the beginning, something. Are those statements based in fact, or are they opinion? Because if they were fact, you'd be able to prove it. Well, we can prove it, Carl and you fundamentalist Hicks, because I'm going to take you to Lawrence Krauss. He wrote a book, A Universe from Nothing, Why There's Something Rather Than Nothing. Uh, what are you going to do? I mean, Carl, Richard Dawkins wrote the afterword. Hello, Richard Dawkins. Ooh. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take you just one clip here. I'm going to take you to the conference. I do this when I do a whole talk on nothing, something from nothing. It's like a 50-minute talk. I'm giving you a nutshell here. Imagine, put yourself in this position. You really want to know how you get something from nothing. The book comes out. It's hardcover only, $35. You buy the book. I'm not doing that, but just imagine, right? You buy the $35 book because you really want to know how you get something from nothing. Now, 
Richard Dawkins is coming into town with Lawrence Krauss, and they're going to put on a seminar explaining how you get something from nothing. You really want to go. Hello? $100 ticket, we're going. You take your date with you. Guys, right? Hey, you're going out on a date. You got to take them out for a meal. So you're going cheap. You go to McDonald's, only 85 bucks. You go to McDonald's. You have your meal. It wasn't that good. You go into the conference, and you sit there, and you learn how you get something from nothing. And about five minutes into the conference, I'm cutting out a lot here. You finally get to this quote, and please, please, listen closely. And what, what we've learned is remarkably this question, which is in, in the sense of cosmology, in my mind, the last bastion of those people who feel there must be a creator, is the fact that it is plausible based on everything we now know that a universe could come from nothing. Now, that doesn't mean it did come from nothing any more than Darwin's uh, argument implied that life absolutely originated by chemistry. We don't know that yet. Similarly, we can't prove that the universe arose from nothing, but the discoveries in, in, in physics and, and cosmology have led us to realize that it's increasingly plausible, and I find that remarkable and worth celebrating. I bought a $35 book, $100 ticket, $85 meal, my date, she left about three minutes ago. I'm out of here. I'm not listening to this mess, right? Not a good night. And then the man who sells me a book entitled A Universe From tells me what? That's what he said, man. What did he say? It is plausible that a universe could come from nothing. Anybody want to define plausible for me? I'll take you to the dictionary. Possibly true. If something is possibly true, then it is also possibly You want me to give up on the Lord Jesus Christ because you got something that might be true? Nah, not doing that. And then he continues on and he said this. All right, oops, I think I skipped one on you. I did, I skipped one on you. Um, no, I definitely skipped some on you. There we go. Escape, Apple Z. That's what I get for skipping around and stuff, trying to, what? Here we go, hit it again. Play. That doesn't mean that it did come from nothing. Any more than Darwin's argument implied that life absolutely originated by chemistry, we don't know that yet. Oh, by the way, then why is that being jammed down every child that goes to a government school's throat? You don't believe that? You're the weirdo, right? We don't know it. Then why are you jamming it down our kids' throats like it's a fact? And then he said, and we can't prove that it did come from nothing. That's what he said. Then why do you sell me a book entitled... A universe from nothing. Why there's something rather than nothing. And before that, he said some other things, but I'm not going to go there. So why am I doing this? Because it's an all setup that I want you to understand that what we have is not an evidence problem. It's an interpretation of evidence problem. I lead tours through the Chicago Field Museum, and when you walk in, I want you to get a, get a picture of the deception that takes place. You walk into the east entrance, and look at this. This is a sign. I'll make it visible for you. From so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and wonderful have been and are being evolved. Charles Darwin. The first time I walked in and I saw that quote, I thought, of course, it's a secular museum. I mean, what would I expect? But then I did something that I'm telling homeschool parents especially to do all the time. Have your children go and do research. You find a topic, you want them to get it, research, and don't be afraid that it's evolution or some topic that, no, we run and hide from that. We don't run and hide. The fact that we run and hide and don't teach them how to deal with it is a major issue. I went and I looked that quote up because I wanted to see it in its full context, right? Because you know words have meaning in context? Oh, I was shocked when I saw the whole context of this quote. So let me give you the whole quote here, right? Uh, because, oh, I'm, I'm cutting this down, sorry. Let's take a look at this whole quote. Here we go. There is a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one. Hello? And that while this planet has gone circling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. 
The original quote, as a minimum, is an intelligent design supporting quote. But if you just read that one little section, you're being lied to. Right across, you're looking at that quote, do a 180. You're going to see another quote. And this one is by, uh-oh, we're in trouble, George Washington Carver. He was a Christian. And they're using a quote from, if a person walks in the woods and listens carefully, he can learn more than what is in a book. Oh, my goodness. He supports evolution. We need to go take a look at this quote in context. And here's what we read. Um, reading about nature is fine, but if a person walks in the woods and listens carefully, he can learn more than what is in books, for they speak with the voice of God. Do you notice that there's a common thing that was subtracted from both of those quotes? But every visitor that walks into that place, unless they dig deeper and don't just settle for the veneer, they don't know that. We have to teach our kids to see through the facade, dig deeper. Now, I do that, why? Because I want to take you inside the Chicago Field Museum and so you, show you one of the exhibits. We're getting there. We're getting there. Waiting for a chick to hatch. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Oh. I want you to see how that question is answered depending on your worldview. You've played this game before, right? Which came first, chicken or the egg? Well, if you say the chicken, well, the chicken has to lay the egg, so the chicken had to come first. Oh, but wait. You can't get a chicken without an egg, so the egg had to come first because you got yourself a chicken. Which came first? Chick-fil-A came after the chicken. <laughs> so thinking people want to know, which came first? Well, you know what the evolutionary model teaches? This is the power of worldview. You, you need to understand. When people, my first Sunday school teacher taught me this, okay? You take evolution, you put it in the Bible, God used evolution. You notice the sequence of evolution, and it fits with the account in creation. That's all I knew, and I believed it. I was sincere, but I was wrong. The evolutionary model teaches something totally contrary. It teaches that the reptile evolved into the bird. So from the evolutionary model, which one came first, chicken or the egg? The egg. Because reptiles lay eggs, and the chicken wasn't here. That's a bird. It evolved from the reptile. Don't trust me. You see, your worldview has an impact on you. It's what uh, is very, oh, by the way, I want to make you aware of this. Dan Letha, uh, he works with me now. He's an amazing artist. And on our app, parents, you have children, grandparents, you have grandchildren. Do they like to draw? Let me tell you about art lessons that are on our app. If you go to the app and you go down to Just for Kids, you hit that Just for Kids tab, and inside there, it has two things that you need to be aware of. Number one is draw it and know it. And Dan teaches your children how to draw. He's got 36 lessons up on there, whatever animal it is. The latest one is the angler fish, right? The cool little fish with the dangly thing that's dark and yeah right and so he, as he's drawing this though he's teaching your children from a biblical perspective about that animal great great tool 36 of those classes and right above that is a thing that says fast facts that is a one month devotional parent grandparent you watch a 90 second video every day and then there's a study sheet in there that has questions based on the video. The answers are in there, all free. And then there's a coloring sheet. If you got any ADDers that got to be doing something with their hands while you're talking to them, hello, me. You print it out. They do the color thing while you're talking to them. Minute and a half video. There's six videos for uh, four animals. So you do one a day, six days a week, and get a 10 to 15 minute conversation. And I'm telling you, by the end of it, you're, you're going to have more than a 10 to 15 minute conversation. You're going to be 20, 25, 30 minute conversation because now you're setting a new pattern. Pray for us. I want to do uh, version two of that as well. But that's in there, absolutely, totally free of charge. The videos, the PDF, printout, the whole works. It's all in there. So, does the evolutionary model actually teach that the reptile came before? Yes, it does. But God said, worldview. God said what? That on day 
5, he created what? Well, first we read here that uh, on day 6, he created the creeping things on the ground. What's a creeping thing on the ground? That reptile. That's day 6. But on day 5, what did God say that he did? 6 is reptiles, and day 5 is the birds. So we can say without any hesitation that the chicken came before the egg because God created birds. He didn't create eggs. He created birds that laid eggs on day five. And that's what we see in the scripture. So I do that because now we have to go after this worldview of dinosaur turning into this. By the way, we said we're going to talk to the birds and see what the birds tell us. Let me give you one bird that just screams that there's a God. All right. I love this bird. It's called a megapode. You know what megapode is? What does mega mean? Big. What is pod? Come on, man. We're in Washington. Big. What's famous out here? Bigfoot. Yes. Bigfoot. Megapod. Not this Bigfoot. All right. There's a different Bigfoot. It's this bird right here. They're called a megapode. And uh, there's a few species of them, but my favorite one is the Australian brush turkey. I had the privilege of going over to Australia and seeing these things. Now, the Australian brush turkey is not like our turkey, okay? Just being honest with you. But it is amazing. It is amazing in that. Um, Thanksgiving time, the Australian aboriginals, yeah, they have a Thanksgiving, and they eat this turkey. You know, do you know how they cook this turkey? You take a pot, boiling water. All right, you get the water boiling. Once you got it boiling, what you do is you put three stones in there and you let those stones get really hot. And then you put the bird in there and it cooks for three days. And then when you get done, you take the bird out, throw it away, and eat the rocks. <laughs> yeah, you don't eat this bird. It's nasty, right? But it's a very, still a very cool bird. All right, so here we go. Um, here is the Australian brush turkey. And what makes them so special? Because with those big feet, they make big nests. I'm talking massive nests. They take those big feet and they just, I mean, they will dig up an entire backyard overnight. We are talking massive. I mean, literally the size of this whole area right here, nest. And they can do it overnight. It's crazy. And once they start building a nest somewhere, they're next to impossible to get rid of. They're, they're just a pest. Why do they build this big nest? Because when they lay their eggs, the ladies don't want to sit on the eggs. They lay the eggs and they put it in that mound of rotting material. That rotting material generates heat. So they bury those eggs. Mama typically leaves. Daddy hangs around taking care of the nest. But he doesn't sit on the eggs either. But we have a problem. What if it gets too hot? Hard-boiled baby's not going to work. What if it gets too cold? Freeze-dry's not going to work either. It has to stay at a very specific range in temperature. So what happens? This bird will dig down with his beak, and it takes temperature readings. And it knows the temperature. And if it's too hot, it'll take material off. If it's too cold, it'll put dark material on to to increase the heat. And this bird figures that out. I mean, uh, now that's a great thing. As you can see him digging. He's, he's going to get down there and he's going to test with his beak to see how hot it is. Guys, but we still have another problem because let's just say, okay, this bird's able to keep the temperature just right. What about the egg? What's happening inside the egg? This is the only baby that when it hatches from the egg, it is fully feathered. It's fully feathered. They hatch from the egg. They climb out of the nest. They run off. They don't spend a day with their parents. They're self-sustaining from day one. What's happening on the inside of that egg as that baby is growing? To illustrate, let's say that we put another 200 people in this room and there's no air conditioning. What is going to happen? Our bodies produce heat. It's going to get hot. As that bird fills up more and more of the space, it's getting hot. How do they turn their air conditioning on? because that's an amazing stroke of luck. Over millions of years, you're never going to believe this. The eggshell of this turkey has air holes. 
but not just air holes. Every egg has air, <laughs> eggshell has air holes or the baby doesn't survive on the inside. These are shaped like ice cream cones. This baby needs calcium so that it can grow all the feathers and all that sort of, where does it get the calcium? It eats the inside of the egg. What's happening to the air holes as the baby is eating the inside of the shell? If they're shaped like this, what's happening to the air hole size? It's getting bigger. He turns his air conditioning on. Now, how did that mother ever figure out that she had to lay an egg that had ice cream cone shaped air holes to begin with? I'm telling you, you talk to the birds and they're going to tell you that God did this. It's an amazing thing. And here's that baby. They're fully feathered when they hatch and they run off into the woods and done. And you want to tell me that that came from a lizard. Well, let's take a look. This is a video from the American Museum of Natural History. And um, it just shows very clearly how the reptile turned into the bird. So here we go. Transformation. All life is a product of evolutionary change. And here's the T-Rex. No, that's Deinonychus, quite frankly, with feathers. Dinosaurs never went away. I mean, pretty cool art, you know. One dinosaur group gave rise to the animals we call birds. There's another one. It's the running lizard, which the other day, the youth, we talked about that, how running makes your legs shrink and your arms grow. And yeah. And then evolution took tens of millions of years, and oh my goodness, there it is. We have the reptile turning into the bird. There it is. You go to the Chicago Field Museum, they have evidence. There it is. Deinonychus with feathers. Now, go do a search on Google and search for path to birds. Here's the image you're going to get. You start over here, given enough time, you get birds. Is this picture fact or is it opinion? You can only know that if you go and do some digging. I mean, where's the evidence for it? I'm going to say that it's opinion because I've gone and done the research, and I want to share that with you. I do this in uh, one of the classes that I teach. You guys are getting off lucky. I'm not making you go do the homework. I will assign one of these to each group of students, all right? we got 20 students, so let's break them down into groups of three, four, whatever. And then each group gets one of those, and they have to go do research, and they have to come back with two pieces of evidence from three secular sources that agree with each other. Okay? And they have to come back, and they have to tell me how old is the fossil, and what was the actual evidence found to support the really cool artwork. That's pretty simple, right? How old is it? What did they find? Three secular sources, see you tomorrow. They come back tomorrow, they're not happy. You can't find three people that agree on these things. So let's do this. I'm going to add one in here just because it's in the museum display. So let's throw him in there, Deinonychus with feathers. And now I'm going to show you, when you go do the research, this is cheating. You guys are getting off so easy. I want you to see what you will find when it comes to how old are these things. Sinosauropteryx, 124.6 million to 122 million years. Velociraptor, 75 to 71 million. Unilagia, 90 to 86 million. Codipteryx, 124 and a half. Uh, Protoarchaeopteryx, 100. Are you noticing anything interesting? They're out of order. Here's what I did. I took their ages, and I put them in the order. Those are their dates. Those are their images. Um, does this show that a bird evolved from a reptile? It doesn't show that at all. I mean... That is now taking, like I did with the skulls of Lucy and human and chimp, and putting them in scale. That is putting them in scale uh, size. So you started with this dinky thing. 
that got really big that devolved to there where it was really tiny? I mean, forget about the other things. So, yeah, does that really work? No. As a matter of fact, remember these names, Sinoceropteryx, Velociraptor, Unilagia, Codipteryx, Protoarchaeopteryx, Deinonychus, Archaeopteryx. Remember those names, because now I'm going to take you to a book called Origin of Birds, The Final Solution. Not a Christian publication. American Zoologist, Volume 40, that's where the publication is. And he writes, my own position is that there is every reason to believe that the ancestor of birds was a small, how do you pronounce that one? Celosaurian dinosaur? Celosaurian? I don't know. Anyway, I hasten to add that none of the known theropods, including Deinonychus, remember that name? Dromaeosaurus. Velociraptor, remember that name? Unilagia, remember that? Nor Sinoceropteryx, nor Protoarchaeopteryx, nor Codic. All the ones that we read before, not a one of them, is itself relevant to the origin of birds. So the whole path the birds chart that they put up there is actually even worse than the March of Progress. And you go down and you read this last little bit. Whether actual ancestors, if found, will resemble in any way the hypothesized stages is unknown, but it is actual observation of real fossils that separates hypothetical deductive science from mere scholarticism. Guys, not a one of those, according to that, not a one of those is in the lineage. One more? Back one more? Sure. All right. Which one? The quote? The quote. Boom, boom. There we go. And there you go. So, yeah, you can find that quote as well if you want. So, guys, there you go. Does this thing work? Does the evidence support that a dinosaur evolved into the birds? Not in the least. I'll give you one example that I give to the kids because I think it's a fun one. The feather. I just think this is a great example. A feather. How do we get a feather? Very simple. We have what is called a protofeather. Yeah. Uh, and Sinoceropteryx, oh, by the way, by the way, we just got done reading that this has nothing to do with bird evolution. But anyway, Sinoceropteryx has a protofeather that got roughed up and then turned into a real feather. Here's the evidence for it. I mean, look, you've got those protofeathers on the back there. Bristly fibers in the skin on the back of the neck and on the tail of the Sinoceropteryx, which is not in the lineage of birds anyway, but let's just go with it. This proves that a feather evolved from a reptile. When you see the uh, reconstruction of it, looks more like a fox or something, you know. <laughs> but anyway, let me go read what they say. Since then, further research has suggested that the protofeathers of Sinoceropteryx were not protofeathers at all. They were nothing more than collagen, uh, structural collagen. Do you, you know what that is, right? You've seen these on lizards, that stuff. Hmm. How about this one? Because when I read these things, I'm like blown out of the water. Although these structures, a scale and a feather, although these structures seem quite different from the horny scales that cover a reptile's body, the difference is in reality not very great. Yeah, a scale and a feather are very similar. They're hard to tell apart here. Encarta, Encyclopedia, a uh, feather, anatomy, horny outgrowth of, skin, uh, outgrowth of skin, peculiar to the bird, but similar in structure and origin of the scales of fish and reptiles. Uh, have any of you ever seen a reptilian scale? Anybody? Have you ever seen the shed skin of a snake? Anybody? Right. This is the shed skin of a snake. Let's flip it over. When you flip it over, that's a reptilian scale, a fold in the skin. Now let's zoom down in on it. And this supposedly gets roughed up over time and turned into a feather. So there it is, that roughed up scale. Now this is, this is going to be very hard to differentiate between these two because they're very similar. You ready? So please get, get this image in your mind because I'm going to now show you a feather and it's going to be hard to tell apart. Okay, so scale and feather. 
I went too fast, didn't I? I'm sorry. Uh, let's go back. This is the scale again. Now I'm going to do it very slowly so you can see that the, just slowly, gradually. Now you can see the difference, right? They're very similar. Are you kidding me, guys? You want me to sell out the Lord because you got a scale that supposedly got roughed up and turned into a feather? A feather is a complex structure going out of the body like a hair. Let me show you this video. It's kind of neat. So inside this shell, the feather develops when it's underneath the skin layer right there. The feather grows inside that shell, and the shell grows with the feather. Isn't that amazing? Hello? Did I lose you? Isn't that amazing? That's awesome. No, it's not. It's terrible. Why? Because if the shell continues to grow with the feather, the feather can never open and you cannot fly with a porcupine quill, can you? You have to get rid of the shell. How do you get rid of the shell at the skin level? Oh, it's an amazing stroke of luck. Over millions of years, what happened is, as that scale got roughed up and turned into a feather and developed the shell, it also developed an enzyme on the skin that just so happens to eat the shell. So the shell dissolves, the feather opens, and the bird can fly. Isn't that amazing? So easy. Guys, this is, this is crazy. And then when you dig down on the feathers, oh, you've got to go find Dave Menton. I am just giving you a nugget. You've got to go find David Menton's talk where he goes into this. The barbules, look, man is constantly ripping off God. We are constantly ripping him off. You go, there's a whole field of study now where, we're, where we come up our wisdom come up with these wonderful inventions where we've stolen it from nature. Hello, Velcro? Anybody like Velcro? Those of us that don't like to bend over and tie our shoes love Velcro. Done. Where'd it come from? Bird feather. Man ripped the bird feather off for Velcro. I was, I was in Kentucky speaking, and this guy is an inventor. He's like this genius guy. He invented a cable, because if you bury a cable, a round cable out in the ocean, I don't care how deep you bury it, over time it works its way back up to the top. So how do they bury a cable that stays underground? He put a coating on it shaped like a horseshoe crab. A plastic covering like a horseshoe crab? You ever seen a horseshoe crab? When a horseshoe crab sucks itself down into the ground, they're next to impossible to dig out. He put that exterior on a shape, uh, horseshoe crab shape, buried it, doesn't work its way back up. Guy's making bank because he's ripping God off, I'm telling you. When you look at a feather and you look at the hooks and, the, and, the, and, and, and where it's got a hook together, let's zoom in just right here. Let's just zoom in here and take a look at this. You have that hook and on the back side of that feather, there's a place that that hook fits in perfectly because if it didn't fit in perfectly, when this thing's trying to fly with all that pressure, what's going to happen? They're falling out of the sky doesn't happen. And by the way, when they molt, they leave the feathers on this side, they lose the exact same feathers on this side in the same sequence, because if you, have, if you lose feathers out here, on this side, and in here, you can't fly. Guys, this is, this is crazy stuff. Talk to the birds. They're going to tell you. They're going to tell you that God has done it. I like Ice Age, personally, right? Somebody wants to tell me that a reptile evolved into the bird. I'm going to give you a perfect example of what's going to happen to a reptile trying to evolve into a bird, and I'll let Ice Age do it. So, where's Eddie? Ah, uh, he said something about being on the verge of an evolutionary breakthrough. Really? <laughs> oh, I'm flying! Some breakthrough. <laughs> yeah. That's how much sense that makes. Now, I gotta let Dave Minton talk to you. I really do. I, gotta, I love David Minton. He passed away a couple years ago now. Out of everybody that I ever worked with, I loved Dave Minton. I did. I just loved when we got off stage and we'd be eating somewhere to just sit and pick this guy's brain. 35 years, Washington University School of Medicine. He was one of the editors for Stedman Medical Journal, right? That's not Christian. He was the guy. Histology. I mean, he studied the human body at a level that's just like so unbelievable. Do you know how cool mucus is? <laughs> I got to tell you this. This is one of the nuggets I gleaned from him. Mucus is awesome. 
If you don't have mucus, you're going to die. Why? Think about it. Car engines. Anybody ever have to have your air filter changed in your car engine? Right? If you don't change the air filter, what's going to happen? It gets clogged up, engine blows up. If you don't have an air filter, what's going to happen? Junk's going to get in, blow your engine up. So you need an air filter. Guess what? So do we. We're breathing in. What are we breathing in when it goes into our lungs? Junk. So what's our air filter? Mucus. It's awesome. It catches those little nasties, and it's in our lung. Isn't that great? I've lost you. Isn't that great? That's horrible. Because all that mucus keeps building up in your lungs, and then we're dead. Nobody's here because the mucus builds up and we just die, right? No. Because we can change our air, air filter the same way that we can do in a car. Do you know how we change our air filter? <coughs> right? No. you got to get something out. Get it out to the point that you can spit it out. How do you get it out of your lungs? It's an amazing stroke of luck. <laughs> Over millions of years, we got these little tiny hair called cilia. And these cilia just happen to be in sequence in the right direction, pushing the mucus up to the point where we can change our air filter. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I lost you again. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. No, it's not. Because here's the problem. Mucus is too heavy. The cilia can't move the mucus. So it just accumulates in our lungs and none of us are here. We're all dead. No, we're not. Why? Because it's an amazing stroke of luck. Over millions of years, not only did we get the hair that just so happened to beat in the right direction, we also got a layer of water that is inside of our lungs that covers that hair to just where the very tip of that cilia breaks the surface. The mucus just so happens to float on water. So as the mucus floats on the water and the cilia hits the bottom of the mucus, what's happening to the mucus? It's being moved up to where we can change our air filter. And that, my friend, came from the process of millions of years, random chance processes. I loved David Minton. I got to let you hear from him when he talks about the feather. So uh, take a listen. They are totally different. Their mature structure is dissimilar. Their function is dissimilar. Their embryological development is dissimilar. Their mechanism of growth is dissimilar. Their mechanism of replacement is dissimilar. Their chemical composition is dissimilar. There's nothing similar between a feather and a scale. And this is not Carl Kirby, the son of a professional wrestler. This is the guy who taught histology 35 years, Washington Professor of the Year University, uh, Washington University. Guys, this whole bird evolution thing, it does not work. Matter of fact, when I, uh, when I did some more digging on this, I, I found this article. What about dino to bird evolution? Oregon State zoologist John Rubin, who commented on the research in a recent uh, issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, said this, this issue isn't resolved at all. He continues, there are just too many inconsistencies with the idea that birds and dinosaur ancestors had dinosaur ancestors, and this newest study adds to that. It is not solved at all. So, path to birds? I'm not afraid of it. And I don't think this generation needs to be afraid of it as well. It's been debunked. 